So now let's uh, repeat a little bit uh, about what we discussed before. So I guess uh, this figure was not clear in the previous video, right? So I hope now you have seen the video clearly. Okay, now I will do this much. I think you have seen the video, right? So, so you can see this cell has been electronegative and this cell has been electropositive. So, uh, you see the neurotransmitter adrenaline is released and this receptor, this is a receptor, okay? This receptor receives the adrenaline and this receptor once it receives the adrenaline the transducer mechanism goes inside the cell and the protein which has alpha beta and gamma subunit it gets hydrolyzed into alpha beta and gamma different subunits and it occurs in expense of the hydrolysis of gtp into gdp okay and uh, this separated different you know component alpha component deactivates the adenyl cyclase okay and this adenyl cyclase once it gets inactivated the normal mechanism of uh, conversion of atp into camp cyclic adenosine monophosphate decreases this process goes down and once this uh, the normal function of CAMP is actually to increase the calcium concentration inside the cell. But since the process of conversion of this ATP into CAMP goes down, the concentration of calcium inside the cell also goes down. And these beta and gamma subunit in turn, uh, which was separated from this single protein, these causes you know, efflux of the potassium. And this whole process, you know, you can see the positive ion is going out and the calcium uh, concentration, you know, the calcium ion, which it should have been there inside the cell normally, is now going down. So you can see the cell is becoming more electronegative and the cell here, as I described earlier, this cell is getting more positive. So this cell is being activated and this cell is getting more deactivated okay now uh, i'd like to come to this point where i had stopped before so a autonomic nervous system is divided into two types basically or two parts that is sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system uses the acetylcholine as their sole neurotransmitters okay so this choline you can see the similarities so this choline and this choline can you see this yeah so this parasympathetic nervous system is often also called cholinergic nervous system and this sympathetic nervous system since it's postganglionic fibers can you see this the only the postganglionic fibers since this postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system uses the adrenaline or the catecholamines, so this is also called adrenergic nervous system. So now that we know sympathetic nervous system can also be called adrenergic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system can also be called cholinergic nervous system, right? So, as I already told, this parasympathetic nervous system's fibers releases the neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are taken by the receptors present on the cell membrane. Right? So, the receptors of the parasympathetic system are of different types. There are several types of receptors. That are used by the parasympathetic fibers okay or simply in another language we can say that the parasympathetic fibers or the parasympathetic system acts on the cells on the or acts on the cell of the effector organs through different kinds of receptors and similarly the sympathetic nervous system fibers 
act on the cells of effector organ through different types of receptors. Okay, so the parasympathetic nervous system has its own different sets of receptors and this sympathetic nervous system fibers also have their own different types of receptors. So now let me describe the different types of receptors. Okay, so uh, let me align this space normally. Okay, so now let's get into the receptors. Okay, I've been seeing this, and so yeah, one thing I forgot to tell, uh, you know, this. Uh, Suppose this is your um, preganglionic fiber and this is your postganglionic fiber of the sympathetic nervous system. Nervous system. You know what? The preganglionic fiber uses acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter, but this uses the adrenaline. Okay, so the form is ADR and or epinephrine. And, but there is exception. In the glands, like sweat gland and the piloerector muscles, the postganglionic fibers also uses not the adrenaline, but the same acetylcholine okay in sympathetic nervous system normally the postganglionic fibers should use adrenaline as the sole neurotransmitter but there are exceptions in sweat gland and in piloerector muscles the postganglionic fibers release the same acetylcholine as it happens in the case of parasympathetic nervous system now let it be now let's get into the receptors right so receptors now let's talk about the receptors used in parasympathetic nervous system parasympathetic nervous system okay so basically there are five types of um yeah let me go through a very beginning there are actually there are you know two types of receptors in parasympathetic nervous system or simply even say the parasympathetic nerve fibers act into the effector organs through two different classes of receptors the first one is muscarinic receptors renic receptors and uh, uh, another is nicotinic receptors okay okay this is uh, the receptors I'm going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system receptor or simply you can say cholinergic receptors cholinergic receptors because these are the receptors through which the cholinergic system acts into the cell or motor in plate right so um muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors are two different types of parasympathetic nervous system receptor or cholinergic receptors and again there are actually five types of muscarinic receptor m1 m2 m3 m4 and m5 and basically there are two types of nicotinic receptors that is basically nm and nyn it's because this is present in the neuromuscular junction this is written as nm and this is uh, basically present in the neuronal junction so this is written as nn right now you can write a small n as for your combinants. Okay, now, 
So among these receptors, some are excitatory and some are inhibitory, okay? Uh, you know, there are five types of muscarinic receptors and I'll tell you how to remember which one is excitatory and which one is, uh, you know, inhibitory. So now here I'm going to show my palm. So can you see my palm? And uh, you see here, my thumb, my middle finger and my pinky are being sewn. And suppose if this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four and this is five. Now the second and the fourth you know, fingers has been hidden here. So the fingers which has been raised here represents the M1, represents the M3 and represents the M5. So the fingers which has only been sewn here are the excitatory fingers or simply excitatory muscarinic receptors. Suppose this is M1, this is M3, M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. So these all three muscarinic receptors, that is M1 muscarinic receptor, M3 muscarinic receptor, and M5 muscarinic receptors. These all are excitatory one. And the remaining two others, these are inhibitory one. So I'm going to write here M1, M3, and M5. These are your excitatory muscarinic receptors. Okay, and these two remaining, these are inhibitory, inhibitory muscarinic receptors. Okay. So, these nicotinic receptors, these both are excitatory. Okay, it's very easy to remember. Excitatory, sorry. And this is also excitatory. Okay, now we'll talk some, you know, a few details about this. Now we'll talk about the characteristics of these important subtypes of the neurotransmitters okay so let me turn the page and so I hope you are seeing this uh, so muscarinic receptor muscarinic receptors Okay, and these muscarinic receptors, as I already showed you here, these muscarinic receptors, uh, you know, act through the G coupled, G protein coupled receptor. Okay, this is G protein, and if this couples with this, if this is involved, this GQ protein is involved, then this uh, we can call is this muscarinic receptor. This muscarinic receptor acts by a G protein coupled mechanism okay um, oh yes mm, let me make this straight so muscarinic receptors now let me write the location okay the location of M1 muscarinic receptor M2 and M3 Okay, the location of M1 is, it is present in autonomic ganglia. Autonomic ganglia and it is present in central nervous system and even, yeah, gastric glands. Okay. The M2, you should remember this, it is present in the heart, okay. M2 receptor is present in heart cells and M2 receptors, these are present in you know, uh, these are present in iris of the eye, 
ciliary muscle and the endothelium okay this is very important okay you should note this um, i would like to highlight this with the red pen m2 is present in the heart and in m3 is present in the endothelium and uh, m3 is also present in visceral smooth muscles okay which are all smooth muscles like muscles in the uh, you know bronchus and muscle in uh, the you know la, even the ciliary muscles as already mentioned and the smooth muscles present even in the uh, you know layer of skins and everywhere and exocrine gland okay and if these are the locations of these receptors then let's uh, talk about the nature nature of these receptors so how these receptors act this act to gq receptor sorry gq protein and this act to gi protein okay uh, gi i already told you gi um this was gi protein okay and this gi means inhibitory this gi protein is inhibitory protein and since this um m2 receptor uh, act uh, you know in coordination with gi and go protein uh, this is uh, also called inhibitory receptors as i already told you before and uh, this m3 receptor is act through gq protein and so these two are excitatory and this is inhibitory okay uh, and um, what are the function of these receptors uh, the function of this receptors you know what it does in the um, autonomic ganglia this causes depolarization and in the CNS it helps in learning it helps in memory it helps in motor functions and in gastric glands it helps in gastric acid secretion and in the heart it causes hyperpolarization polarization you know what is polarization you know what is that polarization means you know intracellularly it makes negative suppose uh, uh, this is your action potential uh, graph and this is your depolarization and this is your repolarization okay what happens in depolarization is basically the calcium ions goes inside the cell and repolarization what happens is the potassium comes out okay and uh, the calcium or even yes uh, or sodium a uh, depolarization in and uh, depolarization can be uh, of any type you know either it be um, because of influx of the calcium or sodium okay if it's not uh, only about the action potential suppose this is mm, a graph that shows um, a potential electric potential and if this is depolarization this is repolarization and in depolarization what happens is the positive ion get into the cell and in repolarization the positive uh, ion again goes out of the cell okay and when the maximum or more positive ion goes from outside goes outside the cell then it causes hyperpolarization okay and when there is hyperpolarization uh, the cell becomes more electronegative and that means the cell has been deactivated or inhibited 
And since the heart is hyperpolarized or inactivated, there occurs decreased velocity of cond conduction and decreased contractility. Okay, and uh, now there is the function of M3, okay? I wrote here, I hope you'll understand that. And this column is for M1, this column is for M2, and this column is for M3, okay? And the M3 causes contraction, constriction of the pupil, okay? Constriction of the pupil. Uh, and uh, you know why uh, constriction of pupil means, you know, uh, suppose um, uh, this is your uh, eyeball, okay, this is your lens, and, uh, okay, and, uh, yeah, this is your ciliary body, and this is your iris, this is your iris. And the uh, hole that is formed in between the two iris is the pupil. Okay, this is pupil. So, contraction of the iris means the contraction. This contraction means it goes up. Contraction of the pupil means the opening of the pupil. The pupil becomes more wider. Right? So, Contraction of the iris or the ciliary muscle. That simply means constriction of the, uh, you know, movement of the people, right? So, if the iris comes down, it relaxes. If it relaxes, then it is the constriction of the pupil, right? So, constriction of the pupil means relaxation of the iris. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the function of M3 is contraction or constriction of the pupil and uh, you know mm, and the, in endothelium it causes vasodilatation and you know how vasodilatation occurs suppose this is your endothelium okay this is your endothelium and these are endothelial cells uh, rather, endothelial should, cells should be like this. Uh, and uh, when the M3 receptor, suppose this is M3 receptor, and when the M3 receptor receives the neurotransmitter, the endothelium, it releases certain substance Previously, it was called endothelin-derived factor. Now, it has been recognized as nitric oxide. By several transducing mechanisms, it releases nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. And this causes vasodilatation. So, this is the mechanism of how, mm, you know, M2 receptor causes the vasodilatation. Okay. And then... Um, mm, and if you want to know more, this nitric oxide is actually produced from arginine uh, in response to nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Um, and it changes to citrulline and nitric oxide. Okay, this way nitric oxide is produced. Uh, and so, um, function of M3 is constriction of the pupil, vasodilatation, and uh, you know, contraction of the smooth muscles. Okay, and uh, so I'll give a single example of the agonist and antagonist. Agonist, okay. Agonist of M1. You know what agonist means? Agonist means the drug, the chemical substance that acts as the acetylcholine okay which acts 
according to you know uh, what the acetylcholine no would normally do on a cell agonist for m1 is oxotremorin it's a very famous drug so i used only the name and oxotremorin and methacholine for the m2 and another m3 agonist is betha nickel and uh, let me write the antagonist this antagonist means you know when this antagonist drug uh, and let me write here pyrenzepine when this pyrenzepine act on the m2 act on the m2 receptor what happens is it acts just opposite to the acetylcholine okay and here it is methoctramine this methoctramine when acts on the m2 receptor it acts just opposite to the acetylcholine and uh, yeah another uh, let me write here derifenacin this derifenacin when acts on the m3 it acts just opposite to the acetylcholine so it's called antagonist but here if since oxotremorin is the m1 agonist it will act or it will show the same process or same change in the cell as the acetylcholine would so okay and uh, the transducer mechanism the transducer mechanism through which uh, this m1 and m2 and m3 acts is you know as i already told you since m1 since m1 this receptor this column receptor is excitatory and m3 is excitatory as i did like this okay m1 and m3 and m sorry m1 m3 and m5 okay mm. this m1 since it is uh, excitatory one you know excitatory one it acts through this pathway suppose this is m1 receptor this is your m1 receptor okay this m1 acts via this mechanism first you know ip3 dag ip3 and dag um, compounds are produced molecules are produced and it increases the intra cellular uh, calcium level and what actually happens is this calcium uh, causes increase of the phospholipase a2 molecule and this also increases pg release again this all you know mechanism you know sum up making the cell more electropositive and more excitatory Okay, so um, we can say the transducer mechanism for the M1 receptor, the receptor of this column, is you know, let me put this here uh, IP3 DAZ pathway that leads to cytosolic solid calcium increase and this would further lead to phospholipase A2 increase and then PG release increase and since this and these are excitatory the you know mechanism of this M1 and M2 are same okay and for this since this is inhibitory one as I described here uh, it acts by a uh, this mechanism okay so what happens here is I'll write from here um, the gas uh, sorry cyclic adenosine monophosphate level decreases that causes decrease in calcium level and this causes this further causes 
uh, or this is the separate mechanism okay calcium level decreases and these two different you know, these two different components you know this causes efflux of the potassium so potassium efflux also causes and these all sum up making the cell more electronegative and so it is called the you know inhibitory receptor